Nicholas Bornos of Capital Inc. and I would like to welcome you to the second video podcast of the Capital Link series, Riding the Waves of a Lifetime. With this video podcast series, we have the opportunity to discuss and interact with maritime industry leaders who share with us life and career experiences, as well as their unique insight on the industry's direction and outlook. And I'm delighted that today we have with us and honored that we have with us uh, Dr. Martin Stopford, one of the most respected and best known personalities in global shipping. We all know Martin as the person who over a 20 plus year uh, period has built Clarkson Research to the global powerhouse it is today. We also know Martin as the author of one of the books that is considered an industry Bible, the book on maritime economics. But there's a lot more to Martin. Martin has had careers as an economist, teacher, writer, information provider, business manager, industry guru, and yes, as a gentleman farmer. Before I start our discussion with Martin, I would like to make to thank him for the excellent and very close cooperation and friendship we have developed over the last 20 years. Martin is a person who is quoted everywhere. He is so acknowledged uh, uh, by everybody in the industry. And I'd like to uh, reminisce and say one of the most successful digital events we have done was last April, uh, April 29, actually, of 2020, when Martin made a presentation on uh, coronavirus, uh, smart shipping, uh, technology, uh, and Martin had a marathon session of three hours, keeping over a thousand people glued to their computer, listening to Martin. And that, uh, uh, that uh, video is available also on YouTube. And since then, it has gotten another uh, 3000 uh, views. So what can I say, Martin, uh, we are delighted. I mean, we're not gonna have a three hour conversation today, <laughs> I'm delighted and honored to have you with us. So thank you for joining us. Oh, Nicholas, it's a, it's a pleasure. I you remind me of that that session because you know you said to me it just went on and on and you said to me it's two hours. Do you think we ought to be winding it up now? So I said absolutely. So we wound it up and then I went to make a cup of tea and looked at my watch. I thought just a minute. It should be six o'clock and it says seven o'clock <laughs> and uh, we've been, it turned out it had been three hours and uh, um, which uh, was quite astonishing. Someone, someone sent me a, a, a photograph of the screen with their lunch. They were eating their lunch while we were having it. You know, this is the great thing about, about Zooming. And Martin, usually people drop off after a certain period of time. People stayed for three hours, a thousand people listened to you. I mean, you know, uh, but that's expected. So anyway. Well, it's as I was saying, you have had an amazing career, a very long, very successful uh, career. How did it all start? How did you get into shipping? Well, I, uh, I, I looked this up, actually, because I wasn't quite sure exactly. But I can tell you exactly. I started work in shipping at 10 a.m. on the 27th of September 1971. And um, it was a bit of... Um, it wasn't an accident, but it was one of these things that you look back and think, well, but maybe it was meant to be. I, after university, I, I did PPE at Oxford, and which is politics, philosophy, economics. I liked economics, but um, some of us decided we would do the hippie trail to uh, to India after we graduated, and we bought an old van and drove overland. You know, and I um, I thought being a prudent chap, I'd try and get a job to come back to, and I went to a few interviews views around London and um, one of them was this little company Maritime Transport Research which was the research arm of the Shipbuilders Association and uh, uh, they said well you know we don't want to wait a year <laughs> sorry and so um, I never really thought about it again went to India came back had a few jobs I, I drove a cake van around Nottinghamshire for a bit and I um, my, my girlfriend's father um, uh, had, bought, had bought a printing works actually, which he wanted to turn into a, a cash and carry. He was a wholesale um, 
he, he had a wholesale um, uh, paper and toy business actually and so uh, he gave me the job of converting this into a, a cash and carry and I did that for about six or eight months uh, it was very successful it worked very nicely um, and um, a bit of a novelty in those days actually and then um, in August 1971 just as I was wondering what I was going to do next the phone rang and who should it be but maritime transport research the um, the girl we offered the job to's left <laughs> how, how do you feel about it so um, I you know I didn't hesitate I said yes it was you know the nice research job nice people small group and um, that really was uh, was how I got into shipping. It was the ship through the shipbuilding side. Very interesting. Very interesting. So again, you have uh, had a career spanning different activities, a multifaceted career, I would say, spanning several areas. So if you look back, what do you consider milestones in your career? If you can pick two or three of them. Yeah, I was um, thinking about this, and I'm not sure that my life has had any really discrete milestones per se. But I, one of the things I often say to people and to myself is that really, like careers and life goes in ten year cycles. Basically, it takes in business it takes ten years to do anything really, and in personal life you've got to get started, think about it, etc. And I, looking back, I think my, um, my my career did fit into really quite a nice series of ten year phases. I in the seventies, maritime transport research, and then as group economist for British Shipbuilders, I learnt my trade and I did my PhD. So that was all finished by nineteen eighty. Um, nineteen eighty one, I was made director of business development at British Shipbuilders, and that. Um, took me into management of what was a very big corporation. I mean, we had 87,000 employees and about 40 companies. And I was doing the corporate planning and um, later got into the um, cash flow forecasting and the budgetary. I did a, a, an accountancy qualification in the early 80s just to sort of cover that, um, that bit. Uh, and so that took me to 1990 with a couple of years at Chase Manhattan Bank at the end. And then um, 1990s, the phone rang again and it was Clarkson's and what a great opportunity that was. And I suppose if there was a, a sort of milestone, I would say probably going to Clarkson's because I wanted to, by this time I'd worked in big businesses. I didn't, I wanted really to try and control my destiny a bit more. And one of the things you find in big companies is if you don't have a cash for a positive cash flow you don't really have much control and so um Clarkson's wanted to revitalize their rather they had quite a small research unit and so I went there and spent the 90s doing that I uh, we did shipping intelligence weekly after about a year which was very much more successful than I expected actually and that paid to sort of build the business and I, we finished the decade with uh, shipping intelligence network in march 1981 which was absolutely at the peak of the dot-com boom uh, then go into the the 2000s and i was moving to a broader spectrum of in clarkson's i went on the plc board i took over the it as part of my uh, uh, activities and built up the Clarkson's global IT system. I tried to build Clarkson Research into a business that was big enough to actually um, support a proper management team because I'd, I'd come to the conclusion that you, you needed critical mass. And so we bought um, a company called Oilfield Publications in 2004, and that added a, a nice diversification to the business and um, uh, of course at the end of that decade I uh, published the third edition of my book Maritime Economics so that was that decade and then next decade bought the farm retired from Clarkson's did lots of talks uh, traveled the world um, I was doing 80, eight, at one stage 82 trips a year <laughs> so 
I think, you know, each decade has been very different and I've learned something. And, um, you know, that is just a sort of thumbnail of how, I don't know where all the time went, Nicholas. <laughs> Martin, I remember we had spoken on the phone several times. And then the first time that I actually met you in person was at the Clarkson's party in the, in the late 90s at the, the Astir Palace at Posidonia. Uh, so I still remember coming in and you were there and we shook hands and we, uh, we spoke. That was quite some time ago. Um, so as we described, you have had such an amazing career. You've done so many things. If I were to pick a challenge that uh, has stuck in your mind, which was that and, and how did you overcome it? Well, another of these questions, Nicholas. I um, I had, had I thought about this quite a lot, but I um, uh, a lot of I mean, business is a daily challenge. But uh, there was one one event which really came out to me, and that was uh, the third edition of Maritime Economics, which I um, did in the. Um, the, the, the early 2000s, and I finished it. And of course, by this time, technology had really moved forward. I mean, when I did the first edition in um, the 1980s, you know, I corrected the proofs longhand and uh, gave it to a secretary who made the changes on the mainframe computer. I did the graphs on this tiny little, uh, it was a, a portable IBM computer screen, which is about four inches square or something, you know, and you're sort of... <laughs> Um, and by, by 2008, you got this wonderful software, you could produce really precision graphs, you could produce wonderful uh, tables, very nicely formatted, and you could drop the whole lot into your Word document. So you got a sense of how the, 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 the book was going to develop. And it was by this time, it was 17 chapters, 850 pages. And I gave it to you. I mean, I guess most people think when you finish a book, you deliver the manuscript. And it was a good manuscript to the publishers and then go and enjoy yourself. But on this occasion, it didn't happen. We sort of waited about a year and this very complex, the galley, the first three chapter galleys came back and there was about 2000 errors in them. Um, and there was an ex, I won't go into why that happened, but, um, and so, you know, I was literally faced with a situation where something had to be done to get this book out. And so I got my jacket off and I worked with the editor, Rob Langham, who, um, I mean, editors don't really do the production side. They, they just, they, they edit, you know, they don't really even edit particularly. Uh, but Rob was, you know, very cooperative about this. And we got together and um, we got a, a, a new team in and, um, somebody to do all the, the uh, uh, graphic artists to do all the maps, which were a particular problem. Uh, we got a, uh, someone to do the, um, the, the, the proof, the copy editing, very good copy editor, and uh, spent a lot of time on the layout. And as it turned out, I think this was a great advantage because I was very hands on in that session. I was able to put in the sort of little touches so that people reading the book could see exactly which section they were in and that sort of thing. I got to, for the first time, I got to design the cover. Um, I was obviously, uh, I couldn't believe we got Hakusai for the cover. I mean, one of the world's great icons, you know, and so, so perfect for shipping. I mean, the great wave and the, the Japanese uh, boats, these, these eight, eight guys in the boat uh, going into the wave, it's just, says everything about shipping cycles, you know. And so anyway, after about two, it took over two years, but it came back and it was finished. And I have to say uh, it was worth it. And I uh, really glad and I was very grateful to everybody who uh, got involved in that. So that was that, that, was that one. <laughs> very interesting. So now if, if I move from the personal side more to the industry side, I mean, your views on the industry are so authoritative and sought after. Uh, what do you consider to be the biggest challenges that the industry is facing today and, and, and looking ahead? Well, I, th I think, you know, we're, we're in a, it's a sort of movable feast. Things have changed a lot during COVID and, um, the sorts of things which five years ago one was sort of almost evangelizing about 
uh, are now widely accepted. I mean, decarbonisation, zero carbon, um, I-4 technology, um, the, um, uh, the, the, I was just trying to remember what the third one was. Oh yeah, changing global geo geopolitical change, you know. I mean, the world's changing. China's not what it was five years ago. So, I mean, all of these things are accepted and they're all being discussed at great, uh, in great detail. I think the, the thing that possibly we're not discussing enough and which is truly challenging is that the business model that the shipping industry has today was not designed to do this sort of thing. I mean, over the last 30 years, um, it's been very much a commoditized business. You buy a ship, you buy a new bulk carrier. It's rather similar to the last one, a little bit better, a bit, little bit bigger, but uh, the technology hasn't changed. And people flagged out in the 80s and have continued to flag out the financial management spread around a whole bunch of global financial centers bulk ship owners probably have one or two people in the office for every ship at sea. So it's um, it, it's very much a cost minimization business. That's what it's designed for. And yet suddenly we're confronted with the challenge of rolling out I-4 technology, which is an essential part, I would say, of decarbonization alongside um, the whole process of getting uh, completely new uh, technology system and propulsion system into the ships which we haven't even haven't even got there yet and so you you, you put all of this together and um, you say well how is the industry going to do this with um, a very traditional very slim um, organization structure and I think that is the great challenge and just to to round that off, if you read what McKinsey's been saying, they've been studying this on land for a long time, uh, you know, the last 10 years, and the companies on land are struggling to get um, uh, to, to, to get I-4 to work. I mean, you know, they get stuck in what McKinsey called pilot purgatory. In other words, you start all these, <laughs> these projects going and you can't kick, you can't get them to spread to the whole business. And so if you can't do it on land, how are we going to do it with fleets of 50, 60 ships spread around the world with crews which were not really recruited to do this sort of thing and with very slim management teams? And that, I think, is the, you know, is the next challenge that we have to get to grips with. And um, it, it, it's a very fundamental one, really. So if I, if I focus on, uh, on what you just mentioned, it seems technology is really a big driving factor in the transformation of the industry, obviously. Uh, if we look back, uh, what do you consider has been the biggest kind of revolutionary technological advancement that we have seen in the industry? And then if we look forward, uh, I mean, technology has many applications, which performance monitoring, environmental technology, communications. Is there one area of technology that you think will have the biggest transformational impact? Well, the, the, it, I guess when you look, what you're looking for going, looking back is something that really transformed everything we do. And ironically, it's the most dramatic thing. What I, I think I would say the biggest um, and most dramatic change in technology in the last 40 years was um, the spreadsheet. In 1977, um, Dan uh, uh, Filstra um, went to see Steve Jobs and he said, I've got this wonderful new program here. It's called, it, it's, um, a, it, 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 it's um, a, a visible spreadsheet. In fact, it's a visible calculation sheet. And um, he then marketed that as VisiCalc. In 1979, I I bought I bought it in 1980. Uh, had a Commodore PET computer, and I would say it, it was just hard to describe how effective it was. It, although it only had 80 columns and 240 rows, suddenly you could actually link together um, uh, accounting tables. We had 40 companies that we were doing budgets for. Um, it wasn't linked like the worksheets today, but it allowed you to consolidate 
It allowed you to structure tables. It allowed you to ensure that the, uh, the, the numerical stuff was accurate in a way which was incredibly labor intensive. And, I, I, and in fact, there's a little clip um, of a, a Steve Jobs interview in 1985 in, on, on YouTube, in which he says that the thing which really uh, kick-started uh, Apple and got Apple going was the spreadsheet. And I, I'd say that's the big thing. And the reason I think that's a, it's a really good example is that something which was easy to use, everyone could use it, and it was massively productive. It really did add value. It enabled you to do things you couldn't do before. So I think if you're looking for something, um, some magic software to do that in shipping, um, the uh, I, I think the the sort of big challenge that's ahead is that we need to be running a fleet of ships as a transport factory. I mean, at the moment, if you think about how the business is structured, each ship is a profit center. Um, and why not? I mean, it, it, it's a discrete unit, which is fine as far as it goes. But in reality, um, we need to get to get to really good decarbonization and to start to do door to door logistics. We need to get those ships working together. We need the people on the ships to work with the people on shore. Um, we need to link that through to the charterers and to slicken up the documentation um, where sometimes on the documentary route, I mean, Maersk is famous for saying on the documentation that one computer, one container has 40 bits of paper, but actually um, it's not really the 40, just the 40 bits of paper. It's the fact that on its journey, there's probably 50 different computer systems handling information about that particular computer. Uh, and th that, that brings us to this key issue of interoperability, of linking systems together. And that is, you know, somehow we need a spreadsheet-like technology which will enable the, uh, the work done on ships, the work done on shore, the work done in the ports and with the, um, the, the, with the, the government organisations and so forth to be linked together in a way which is easy to use and allows legacy systems to communicate. And that's a big challenge. There, is a, there, are, there, there are potential um, answers to this, uh, but it's, um, it, it, it's a great challenge. I mean, things like Apache Kafka and things like that, you know. Where are we in that process, uh, Martin? I'm sorry, I didn't... Where are we in that process of development? Um, well, um, I hate to say this, but we're struggling. Um, I've worked with a few companies over the years, and the trouble is, Nicholas, this is... Um, you know, this is a business where, like, I mean, like one tanker company I worked with, we tried to do some simple things like measuring fuel consumption, which you would think was pretty easy. I mean, you've got flow meters on the ship, but it turns out that the flow meters all are sending information in a different uh, digital format, and the manufacturers won't, won't or can't necessarily tell you how to decode that information. Some of the flow meters turned out to be installed back to front, you know, so... <laughs> And um, then, then after after a few months, the, the VLCC market was so awful that the um, the finance director I was working with said, "Look, we're going to shelve this for a bit. You know, it's too difficult." And this was a you know, it, it's it's very challenging. And um, as I said, McKinsey's found this a challenge in um, on land. And I think that we are looking for some very good software people. Um, you know, there are companies um, that, that, that all over the place that are working on this stuff. And we are looking for somebody who's like Dan Filstra, who can come up with these systems. Um, and then we've got to have the people in the business to make it work. You know, it's, I mean... Well, now that you mentioned the people, exactly, I wanted to connect technology and people. We talked about automation a lot. And... Sometimes automation means we expect the human factor to be replaced. But up to what extent can this happen? 
Well, I, I think in a way, uh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't use the word autonomous ships because I think in a way that's a slight, it is really a red herring. Of course, there are going to be ships that can operate on their own, but what, um, and forgive me if I seem to be pushing McKinsey quite a bit, but they do, they talk about these things and it's very interesting to read what they have to say. And, you know, one of the things that, um, that they say is that the mistake that businesses make, and they're not talking about shipping here, is that you start with the technology and you say, how can we apply this? Um, and you stick telematic stuff all over the ship. You know, we've got 3,000 telematic devices on our ship and you harvest the information and nobody looks at it, even if it, and the bit they look at is often not the most important bit. So, uh, and what McKinsey says, you turn it around and you, you start with the value added. You say, what is the, that we can add value? Um, how can we, uh, to, to the whole process? And very often in a business like shipping, adding value is all about giving the guy on the bridge, in the engine room, in the office at work, um, in the port, the information they need to make very important decisions. Um, I mean, let me give you an example. Um, I was talking to someone from Hamburg port who they built a, a very big container terminal to um, accommodate the super container ships. Uh, I, I forget how many, I think it may, it, it's got lots of cranes anyway. I forget, I forget whether it was four or six cranes. But what they said is the cranes are fine, but you need, in order to use all the cranes, you need very, very accurate cargo manifests. You need to know where every single box on the ship is because you've got to figure out what you're going to take off, what you're going to put on, and uh, where you're going to put back everything so you can get it out the other end. And for that, you need all that information in good time. And in principle, there is a container crane somewhere in the world that knows where every one of those boxes is and has that probably in digital information. But getting that piece of information to the guy running the programs in, um, in Hamburg and trying to coordinate the cargo handling operation, that's a very, very big job. And um, uh, again, this is something you need the right organization and you need the right software. And as I say, there are new software approaches that can help to do this. So taking our discussion to a little bit of a different direction, I mean, you are, as a global industry guru, you are on the go all the time. Uh, I mean, you travel all the time. We as Capital Inc are grateful and honored to, to have been with you together pretty much all around the world. So how do you balance uh, work and personal life? Of course, right now we don't travel, but you know, we're going back to it at some point in time anyway. Uh, well, I, I must say, having, having traveled a bit with you guys, I really enjoyed this. And it's, it's always much more fun traveling with other people. And you, um, and I did some wonderful uh, trips around China with Jeremy Points, uh, one of our uh, contemporary dry cargo broker. We had a great time. And it's a lot more fun, except I don't really like going to nightclubs. So, I mean, we had this deal eventually that at 10, we'd have dinner with whoever it was. And then at 10 o'clock, Jeremy would go to the nightclub and I'd go back to bed and Jeremy would, I'd meet him on the way back from the nightclub at breakfast, you know. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but I mean, that's, I mean, you know, um, well, everybody does what they, they're they good at. I can't cope with that sort of thing. But I, um, uh, well, I, uh, I guess one thing that's very helpful is that I have a switch up here, which I can just switch on and switch off. I'm a bit of a tunnel vision person, but I'm not too bad at once I switch from one thing to another. I find it quite easy to work up ahead of steam. And um, the things I do, I, I, I keep fit. I've always done that. I mean, if I'm on the farm, um, I keep a bit too fit. You know, I just <laughs> weighed myself and found my four days on the farm, I lost a kilo and a half. <laughs> Um, uh, if I'm in London, I go. I like cycling. Go cycling round um, Regent's Park. I mean, it's a bit bit embarrassing. I can't keep up with the light light for a brigade now. Uh, but not even the girls. Well, I have to be careful what I say. But, uh, they, well, uh, the, the, you talked about the farm, so 
<laughs> you brought up uh, the next uh, question. That's uh, tell us a bit about the farm. I know it's a big part of your life, and I read that you are building a zero carbon tractor. <laughs> well, well, funnily enough, that yeah, that that's I uh, come back to the zero carbon tractor, but I. Um, uh -huh. I, I never read that, but I, it was certainly something I fancied doing. I, um, yeah, I bought the farm in nineteen uh, in, in two thousand and nine, uh, just after I finished my book. Actually, it was a vulnerable period. You know, you finish one project and suddenly you start thinking you get crazy ideas about doing something else. I'd I'd always um, wanted a farm. Um, I my father used to do a bit of farming and. Um, I really enjoyed that. And also, having spent 30 years, not quite at a desk, because I'd done so, but I'd never really been on the sharp end of business. And, you know, I thought it's it's a good discipline at the end of your life to really understand what the world is. And so um, and I came across this place, which had been um, sold in 1922. It was part of the Earl of Shrewsbury's estate. It was Georgian Farm with some old buildings. And I honestly don't think anyone has spent any money on it since 1922. It was, as, as Barry said, you know, you lean on a, on, a, on a fence post and it falls over, you know. <laughs> um, but it was, it was original. I thought someone needs to look after this. It had a nice river and um, it um, was about 110 acres and along the river valley with very, spectacular scenery and water meadows, flooding meadows and um, nice hay meadows and so forth and the beautiful beech woods. And um, so I, uh, and, and some old cottages, uh, some old farm buildings to convert into stables, into holiday lets. So I did all of this. I sort of got it back into decent shape, worked with a very nice um, farmer, Andrew Byron down in, Denston who milked, but he had, he only had 50 acres, so he needed more land. And so I, um, I grazed his cattle and um, we, we, uh, we, we mowed it and I overwintered some of them. Not, not a lot, you know, but it was um, uh, fascinating. It, it was uh, completely different. And uh, I think an, uh, another, a, a different, another word. Do you know, the one thing I learned out of that because it started with the decarbonisation. And, you know, the, uh, there's a guy, Craig, who's a digger driver, and uh, very I've used him quite a lot. And let's say we've got to grub out a whole bunch of stuff and we want to do a bit of re-landscaping at the bottom of a field, which is, um, which is you know, flooding, not going properly. Oh, you give Craig... Uh, a bit of diesel oil and his digger go down the, he goes down the field by the time I get down there he's done more work than I could have done with 10 men, men in a week you know it's just astonishing what you can do with fossil fuels and I think that really brought home to me that not only that we should be decarbonizing but we should be saving what little fossil fuels we use for the things where there is abs you know where they are really effective and then I started thinking about the zero carbon tractor, which is perfect. You know, it can a tractor can carry a ton of batteries. You um, you put it you put up solar panels to charge it. Um, they love um, tractors. Need lots of um, of um, torque, and you can buy all the equipment you need to um, hydraulically drive the wheels separately. Um, bear various people. I, I sussed this out at one of the shipbuilding exhibitions. So you could do it. Um, and I did have um, a, a meeting plans with one of the, uh, the Bamfords who make JCBs, but um, not, not uh, but, but actually, uh, I mean, I was busy and it never happened. And not, not because I was not busy, but uh, so. Sadly, Nicholas, I can't I can't unveil a, a, a zero carbon tractor, but it's a very good project for for someone more entrepreneurial than I am. You know. <laughs> well, Martin, uh, I have said the farm is quite an undertaking, and um, I mean you are such a terrific personality doing so many different things. Uh, 
But let me ask you, again, taking our discussion forward, with the pandemic, we have all gotten used to a new norm of communication. And you and I have talked about that many times. Now we have digital meetings, digital conferences. Uh, we lack the physical contact, but we have, it's a lot more easier to communicate, bigger reach and so on. How do you see the whole communication aspect evolving past the pandemic? We're coming out of it, hopefully. I, I think, um, you know, it, well, uh, you, you could say that Zoom is a bit like the spreadsheet. It was something that came along. And I, I mean, the last few years I was doing sort of 30 or 40 trips a year. You would trudge through Terminal 5 and think, why am I doing this? I'm flying to Hong Kong to give a 30 minute talk, see a few people and come back again. It doesn't make sense. And I think, you know, Zoom like a spreadsheet it won't do everything and it won't tell you what you should put in your budget but it will certainly make the whole process of communicating in a pretty good face-to-face -face way better and i think the the really good thing about the the zoom type of communication that we're doing now is that i i was never a fan of video conferencing because i found when i tried to lecture over video conferencing, you couldn't see, you couldn't see people's faces, you couldn't get their body language, you couldn't actually control what you saw on the computer. All you saw was this big screen with people sitting around it, you know. Um, so I was never sold on on video conferencing, but in a way, Zoom has brought the mainframe stuff onto the PC, and now we can. I, I've no doubt that we can develop this and all the technology is absolutely shooting ahead. People like Black Magic and so forth are really moving this along. And I think it will probably shipping must be in the top 10 of industries, perhaps the top five of industries that are going to make really get an enormous benefit out of it. I would think so. I mean, actually it has already so far. Uh, so, you have been involved, Martin, with so many projects and, and initiatives. And uh, if you consider yourself being in retirement, you have given retirement a completely new meaning in terms of activity <laughs> and intensity. So, you should have, you yeah, should have seen me when I came from the farm yesterday. I was upset. <laughs> so, what is next on your, on your agenda? Well, um, I. I've got, um, I've got four things on the list at the moment. I have decided very reluctantly that I'm going to have a shot at selling the farm because it's a good time. Everybody wants um, a lifestyle, uh, you know, is, is very popular in this country. Um, and um, I'm, you know, I'm into getting into my mid 70s and I really, I don't, I'm fine now, but in five years time, I'm not sure I can manage the physical work, you know, so I think that's prudent. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to give that a shot. And anyway, it should, the farm is so nice, it should have a young couple with three kids and a wife who likes keeping chickens and, and well, actually that's I'm, and, uh, just and, I'm, and a wife who has a, a, an enormous career and a husband who likes keeping chickens right <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, the um, so that's one thing I'll, I, I'm, I'm going to see how it goes if, if I can um, uh, I wouldn't be too worried if I couldn't sell it but um, I'm going to do the fourth I want to do the fourth edition of my book and I'd also like to do a slim book on uh, maritime technology, which is really geared at businessy people, not hardcore, because I found as I was updating the fourth edition and I've been doing it really <clears throat> lecturing more about technology in the last 10 years and about markets. So I want to do that to get all of that. And I've written a lot of it. I've got, I've got quite a lot of material for that. Um, and I've got an e-learning business that I want to kickstart if I can, and I just need to hire one or two people to get that going. So um, I think if I can move the farm off, that'll be very helpful because it, I get two days a week, but two to three days a week back. That's been taking quite a lot of my time. And um, I'm hoping I can nail down some of these other things. <laughs> That's quite an activity list, uh, Martin. I have to say this, uh, you know, uh, well done. And uh, 
So we are already in about uh, 40 minutes into our discussion. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, if I can uh, ask you just a few more questions. Um, after building such a successful career, if you look back to your younger self, is there some kind of advice you would give different from what you've done or? Well, I, um, <laughs> I, I always, um, what I always say to students, and I think it's sort of generic bit of advice, but according to my cycle analysis, which has been a, a, the bedrock of my <laughs> career, I would say, you know, I've got 250 years of shipping cycles uh, stashed away there and another 60 in reserve for the next edition of the book. Um, I, I reckon from that, the industry over many centuries has spent 60% of its time in recession. And so you really, <laughs> you, you really got to get your mind around the fact that you, um, you're going to spend a lot of your time in recession. And then once you do that, you realize that actually the really good times are the recessions because the booms, very hard to do good business in the booms. I mean, if you go back to the 80s, <clears throat> 1980s recession, which was really awful. And you know, you think there's old John Fredrickson sitting in the, uh, the, 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 the corner of the theater cafe in the Intercontinental Hotel in Oslo, um, uh, fixing VLCCs. They used to call his table Carg Island, I think. And he, he built up a massive business in the 80s in a way that you just couldn't do. In, you know, you can get started. And so I think one shouldn't think that just because markets aren't good, it's not a time that should be neglected. It's a great time for people without any baggage to come in and really get started, you know? And so I'd say, um, get to grips, get your mind right, accept that uh, recessions are part of the business and make sure that you put them to good use. Is there some kind of, uh, let's say, guideline or rule or axiom that uh, people, you, you urge people to follow? Um, well, I think there's, um, there's a few things. Uh, I mean, obviously, you've got to have something to do. You've got to figure out what you want to do. That goes for anything. And, um, you know, whether you start with McKinsey or cleaning your house, you've got to figure out how you're going to do it. And then I think um, there's, there's the whole quote. The first thing is you've got to finish what you started. And I remember my father saying to me, we, we walked past one of my, um, my motorbikes in the, I used to take cars and motorbikes apart in my teens. And we walked past one of my motorbikes that was spread all over the yard. <laughs> he, he said, Martin, you really have to, to, to learn to finish things, you know. Um, and uh, of course, often it's harder to put things back together than it is to take them apart. Uh, but, that, but, but that finishing things is one. Um, I think um, the... Um, I think you need to do things as well as possible. One of the things I found on the farm, it was very hard to persuade some of the guys that actually, they, they all want to save me money. They buy the cheapest materials. It's very hard to convince them that actually it's, it's the labor that costs money, that you really want to buy the best you can possibly afford because 10 years later, you'll be very glad that you did it really well. You know, like I put, um, uh, uh, you know, things like you use special timber for the windows, that sort of thing. Um, and um, then I think the other, the final thing is you shouldn't be greedy. You should always leave something on the table. I mean, that's, I mean, I know it's trite, but it's, it, it, it's true, you know. It's, right, it's, right. You know. Martin, thank you. We, we've got a wonderful discussion and I don't want to take uh, too much more of your time. Uh, really thank you for your insight. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. Uh, before we close, any any final remarks? Um, well, I guess in shipping, everything comes back to people. It, it really is a global village um, and uh, is getting even more so as we chat with each other around the place. Uh, I... Um, 
and, and that has been fantastic. All the people I've worked, I, the most memorable thing about the business actually is not the ships, it's the people. And the, um, and the people that have helped me, uh, sometimes I've been able to help them. You watch people, young people grow and develop. And it's a, you know, I think that's the, the best part of the business is you see things grow in stature and then you, you have to move on, you know, and that's, uh, that, that's the way the world is. It's a great business, Nicholas. I, uh, I, I was, didn't know how lucky I was on, uh, at 10 o'clock on the 27th of September, 1971. <laughs> Quite, uh, well, I think you were not the only one who was lucky. We were lucky to have you as part of this wonderful community. And you're right, at the end of the day, it's people who make uh, this industry so unique. And maybe to close with a, a more optimistic, well, not with not a more with an optimistic note. Everyone seems to believe that we are the forefront of a golden age for shipping. Did you share into this uh, optimism? I I think in its own way, every age is a golden age for shipping. I I used to in my. <laughs> In, in, in the early 90s, I would follow Eric Shaw around doing lectures about time chartering. And for Eric, um, the golden age was when the, the oil companies gave you 20 year time charters, you know, and this was for brokers was fantastic. And it never came back. I mean, it happened in the 60s. Um, and I think in the 60s, when it happened, um, it. it um, uh, people didn't really quite see it that way. I think you look for the, the, the hidden lining ahead. And if by golden age, you think everyone's going to get, get as rich as they did in 2008, then we should be so lucky, you know, <laughs> um, I'll hang around. But, but I think that the golden age is we're rebuilding a business. I think the shipping, the ship owners, are going to, one way or the other, are going to have to get together with the charterers again. I don't see how we're going to finance the ships and arrange the, um, the, 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 the very big changes in the business that are going to have to take place without bringing the cargo in, because, you know, the cargo call the shots. Anyone who's sat at the back of a shipbroking company for 25 years knows that the, the, the real authority of the charterers. And I think from the charterers' point of view, um, they've sat back for the last 20 years and taken ships off the spot market. And now they're going to have to um, pick up the baton and run again with it, as they did in the 50s and 60s. And then they dropped it in the 70s and 80s. So I think it's, a, yes, a golden age, but you've got to think about how you're going to make your money in the golden age. You've got to find yourself a, a plot, you know, a, a, a plot to... Um, to excavate for your gold, basically. If you're gonna have a gold rush, that's what you gotta do. Maybe we can also call it the new age. Instead of the golden age. Yeah, yes, it is. It's, uh, it is very unique uh, without going on too long. But one of the things in my book of technology is that I reckon technically ships, uh, the, the shipping industry has only changed three times in the last 5,000 years. If you actually look at the, the way ships are built, there's only been three fundamental changes, and I think we might be going into the fourth. But that's for another lecture. Isn't it? <laughs> Martin, in closing, uh, who, do you have in mind what would be the first place we would like to travel to when we all can get on a plane and travel safely? Um, <laughs> I assume that doesn't uh, doesn't include beaches somewhere, you know? <laughs> Why not? I mean, uh, personally, I would love to go to a Greek island and spend some time there. So I it doesn't need to be business related. Well, maybe that's that that that's not bad. It would be really great to to see the guys in Piraeus again and just sort of get a get a feel for what's going there and the um, the west coast of Norway. I mean, both you know the Greeks and the Norwegians both riding hard and then round it off with a little trip to Shanghai and uh, see what the Chinese are up to. I think, I think it's going to have to be a multi-center multi trip. <laughs> but we can embark on a global trip together again. Martin, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, as always, it, it's a pleasure and an honor to, uh, uh, to be with you. Thank you again for being with us.
and uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully traveling together soon again. Nicholas, thank you so much. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>